everybody to uh, a another episode of Insta Vlogs. We're gonna be doing the IMO vlog. Got a bit of a cold here, so please bear with me in terms of the sniffles. Uh, anyways, uh, I started this vlog a while ago, the IMO vlog, based on what I'd seen from Awesomeness TV called IMO. And basically, they were a group of beauty gurus uh, accompanied by some teen stars. And they attempted to do an Oprah thing, but it was about five minutes in length. It was about like a five minute clip. And the thing is, the thing on itself, you can't do anything in depth uh, in five minutes. I mean, the thing is, right now, YouTube really seems to think that you can do something in depth within five to ten minutes and that's not possible uh, and so that's the uh, goal of this uh, series is to start breaking that stereotype that that something can be done in five minutes this goes really into depth into things it takes you outside the standard textbook it takes you outside the standard knowledge and looks at things from a research perspective from a research research from a researcher's perspective and that's basically me and I show you the notes that I've taken on it and uh, that there's various different views uh, that I come up with or, or, or in thoughts that I have as I move along. And basically, uh, this type of Insta vlog is a essay put together from my notes. I have my notes in front of me here. Uh, they are not written into an essay at all. And what I will be doing is uh, developing uh, an essay uh, from these notes, and you can see how I go from the notes to the essays. And now the essays eventually will become documentaries. So there will be more graphics in here, and you know, and uh, you know, it will be it will become a, if you will, a, it will move into a documentary format. But initially, uh, an essay is just like like a lecture. It's about an hour in length, uh, and this uh, series is going to be an hour in length. The uh, the IMO vlog series is going to be about an hour in length each episode. And um, we will be talking about things that typically pop up on shows like IMO Vlog, uh, Oprah, Dr. Phil. We're going to go take what we call the standard or the pop psychology or the popular road. We're going to take that popular topic and we're going to lift the lid and see behind it. And that's what the whole goal here is. And so I initially started off you know, jumping right into the bat, uh, right into the, the uh, fray, I should say, right into the fray, into the mix, if you will, uh, talking about slut shaming. And they realized that we have to back off a little bit and take a look at the initial topic itself. And this is the, the audience that we're aiming towards. And these are tween and teen girls. Teen, tween and teen, tween and teen girls. Uh, this typically between the ages of uh, nine years old and uh, all the way up into uh, 18, even 19. There is a rhetoric and then there is a reality. And what we're going to do is we're going to take a look first at the rhetoric and then slowly pick away at the rhetoric and look at the reality. And this will sort of come into, uh, this will bring the whole uh, topic of slut shaming uh, within this talk itself. So this is a, a larger topic. And then we will have subtopics that will sort of deal with other different aspects of things that as we peel away the layers uh, to find out what's beneath everything. And you'll see how that one series or one sh episode will leave it, lead into the other. And so the way of, of 
kind of uh, I'm doing the episode numbering is I'm labeling the episode by the week. So this is the forty seventh the forty seventh week of uh, two thousand fourteen, and that's how this episode is kind of numbered. It's it's, it's, it's episode uh, forty seven uh, week. Uh, uh, it's basically forty seven dot week dot uh, two thousand fourteen. So it's the forty seventh week of two thousand fourteen. And that's kind of how um, I'm going to be uh, labeling these uh, episodes. And so you can sort of follow along and see when what was done. And at some point in time, I'll also be uh, putting in some of the uh, uh, the InstaVlog notes in here as well. Some of the just the, actually the notes themselves. And so you'll be able to see how you go from the notes. And the thing is, you can also connect this to back to the BTS log, which are the ad hoc notes. Uh, ad hoc notes come first. This is, these are your random notes here and there. Uh, then instant vlogs are the more organized notes, and then as we go through the instant vlogs and produce the essays, the, the notes become further and further organized. So until, until you have uh, uh, a, a pretty decent library based of notes, I uh, know a library of notes. So, uh, and that's kind of where we're going with that with this. Uh, but as the thing is, we're going to follow the uh, format rule. Of scientific journaling, that means uh, we are not going to be editing. We're not editing this. Uh, if I make a mistake while I'm talking here, uh, I'm not going to edit it out. I'm going to simply note it, and then we'll move on. Uh, and that's how we're we're going to deal with things. So uh, you're not going to see censorship here. Uh, nothing's going to be edited out. Nothing's going to be deleted. And this is kind of uh, the way we'll approach things. So what we're doing is we're going to go beyond. The general textbook knowledge, and general textbook knowledge is, is what you stand, what you typically learn in school. Uh, you you go to school, you get a textbook. The teacher teaches from the textbook, and this this includes all the way up into the second year of university. That many teachers and professors will teach from the textbook, and you learn. And your job is to learn what's in, within the textbook, and you learn, and you only learn the views that are presented in the textbook. In other words. The views of society are generally re generally represented in, in in the textbooks, and so you you have to conform to these ideas. Here we're going to go beyond that. We're going to break down these walls. We're going to we're going to break outside the textbook and look at the underneath under the the, the very we're going to look at the very fabric of how standard or general knowledge is constructed. And then once we can understand that, we can determine whether or not the standard or, or, or constructor knowledge is something that's either wrong or it's right. I'm going to give you an example here. Uh, there is a question, and was well, a question uh, that's been asked a lot, not by uh, kids specifically, but by other researchers, was how did the Holocaust happen? You know, how did, how did, how did German society and its, and its uh, all his trappings. How did it happen that Hitler was able to go up and do what he did? And, and as you lift the textbook, you, you sort of go beyond the textbook, and you look beyond what the standard phrases are or what the standard thought is. You begin to understand that something was happening in in uh, German society. The society as a whole started becoming psychopaths. In other words, they could not tell when something was right and when something was wrong. And so when it came time for, for Hitler to do what he did, they couldn't tell, the German society couldn't tell what he was doing was wrong. They just didn't understand it. It was beyond their capacity to understand what he was doing was wrong. They didn't understand this. They thought he was doing a good thing. And this is kind of why you knew, do need to question what you're told. You do need to question uh, standard or accepted knowledge and understand where that knowledge came from. Does it come from a point of something, something good or is it something bad? And then we'll look, at, we'll look at morality. We'll look at the consequences of morality or the lack of morality. And so this is, like I said, going to be something that's a little bit more in depth than you're used to. It's going to be, uh, I think, a little bit more challenging. And in this particular episode, we're going to start off looking at tween and teen girls. We're going to look at the uh, uh, reality versus rhetoric, or initially we're going to look at, do rhetoric versus reality because we're going to look at the rhetoric first, and then we're going to start peeling away the rhetoric 
and looking at the, at some of the reality. So, uh, in the next segment, we'll come back and uh, look at that. So we'll have initially our introduction is going to be uh, one ten minute segment, and then we will have three fifteen minute uh, segments after that. So that will produce that will produce just about an hour. Anyways, I will see you in the next segment. Alrighty, take it easy. Be prepared to have what you know challenged by Cyborg Alpha TV Network. Alrighty, welcome back everybody to the next segment. Uh, this is uh, the IMO vlog. We're talking about uh, teen and tween girls. Tween and teen girls. We're talking about rhetoric versus reality. And we want to know what is what. But rhetoric is, by definition, in many ways, it's hype. It's uh, the advertising, it is what is stated about girls. And this is not always true. There are of, often uh, issues and uh, details that are left out of rhetoric that when you go take a look at rhetoric and in comparison to reality, go take a look at a real girl, you'll find that often real girls do not meet, meet the standard of rhetoric. In other words, they don't come up to what was being stated about them. It does, and that's not necessarily a bad thing. It's not that, that, that oh, you know, people should be living up to rhetoric. That, that's not always the case. Sometimes, because in many cases, we're not, uh, the person, the individual, is not in control of what the rhetoric is in terms of what's being said in society, what's being said in the media, what's being stated in the media, the images portrayed in the media. Uh, these are all part of the rhetoric. And... To understand this, to understand where we're going to go with this and how we're going to sort of uh, peel this away, we have to know the sort of, what's called, we have to create something called a, a scale, a, a term of measure, and what knowledge is in society. And the general knowledge that, that typically you have is, uh, is called general knowledge. That's your general, you know, and that's basically kindergarten to grade 12, grade, kindergarten to uh, second year of university is your standard knowledge. Uh, and there are different levels in there, of course, uh, within the, within the with, the with the standard and general knowledge. But really, it's general knowledge is what is accepted by society is to be true, and and uh, call it, so in some cases scientific, but not always. And this is what this is the the general knowledge is what you'll find in your textbooks. You'll see this on PBS if you watch any of the PBS or or uh, any educational programming. Uh, a lot of the general knowledge is presented in there, and you can go take a look at different shows, particularly in the kids, over the decades, these educational programming, and see how general knowledge changes from decade to decade. So I understand that general knowledge is not solid, it's not concrete, it's not always the way it was. But general knowledge changes from generation to generation. About every 10 years, uh, what is considered to be true changes. Uh, I'll give you an, uh, an example here. If you go back to the TV show Lizzie McGuire, what you will see in Lizzie McGuire is completely different from what you will see in the Disney TV show Live and Maddie. In Live and Maddie, there's a lot of cell phone, a lot of sort of Today's uh, uh, kids' shows have a lot of cell phones in them. And you go back to Lizzie McGuire, and there's a scene in Lizzie McGuire where they're using a payphone. And today, payphones are more or less obsolete. The mo most payphones have been removed. They're no longer in use. And this is because of the change in technology. So the change in technology caused a change in reality. And this reality is reflected in various different kids shows. And so this is how you see how 
general knowledge from generation to generation or, or from decade to dec decade changes. You know, this is based on the change in technology. And as the change in technology occurs, we have more and more devices, we have more and more information, and there is, in, in this particular generation, an attempt to control what information is considered to be real and what information is considered or, or what information is considered to be wrong or not real. You know, real and not real are, are, are right and wrong or, you know, <laughs> what is acceptable to society. And this is kind of the general scale of, uh, this is general knowledge. But then there's something called advanced knowledge. And part of, or a component of advanced knowledge is hidden knowledge. And this is, you're introduced, in many cases, students are often introduced to the advanced knowledge within the second year of university and above. Uh, it, is, it is not textbook based, it is based on research. It, 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 advanced knowledge is research based knowledge. And in many cases, it often challenges and tests the knowledge that is within textbook, textbooks, or we'll call it general knowledge or textbook knowledge. You know, general knowledge and textbook knowledge are interchangeable. They're both the same because uh, the, the knowledge that was that's within textbooks is the general knowledge, it's generally accepted. The advanced knowledge goes into and picks apart and examines the knowledge within textbooks, and that's generally your general knowledge. And we're kind of repeating ourselves a little bit here because this needs to be understood that what we consider to be real in our textbooks is not often real. It is simply an opinion or a view held by one particular person that's now become common to everybody else. And that's why it's in the textbook. And of course, kids are expected to learn this. And this becomes the, if you will, the standard knowledge or the general knowledge of the next generation. In advanced knowledge, because you're trying to pick apart and examine general knowledge itself, this and this occurs incidentally. It doesn't necessarily, not necessarily you're going out specifically to challenge general knowledge. As you begin to do your research, you begin to notice problems with general knowledge. You begin to realize that there are holes there, that things are not as complete or as thorough as you thought they were. And as you go into search, start looking at these holes and see how big they are, you find more and more in there and you find more and more content. And as the content grows, you become uh, more aware uh, of uh, that there is more knowledge than is generally presented. And some of it is hidden. It is, it is specifically hidden from view. And once you begin to realize that, there's, that, that there is hidden information, you start seeing, oh, this information not only wasn't presented, it's actually actively being hidden. And this brings us into the topic, in many cases, of illegal and legal information. What information is legal? What, what can you and can you not talk about? And this is in the society that supposedly believes, you know, as, as a free society, we believe in free speech. Well, wait a minute here, you start looking at this about free speech, and you find out that, well, no, not necessarily everything is about free speech. That speech, in many cases, is, is limited. That there is a actual dividing line between legal and illegal information. And that with certain information, if you have certain information on you, no matter, no matter how you learned it, it's considered illegal information, and you can end up going to jail for it. Not because you committed any crime, because you murdered somebody, or beat somebody up, or or rape somebody or anything, you know, you're not, you know, you're not on that criminal level there. But the law treats you as that, it, it marks you as that, as a felon, simply because you have certain thoughts or have certain bits and pieces of information. And this is something that's not supposed to happen in this society, but now has. And this is what you start finding out as you begin doing this type of research. So. And, then, and, it's, and, it's, and it's, it's a bizarre type of thing because you now realize that there is certain information that you can't divulge completely and that you can have to sort of be careful with because you are going into areas that might be viewed as illegal. 
and that you could get a lot of trouble for, into a lot of trouble for, if someone finds out that you have this particular bits of information. And so this is where you, be care you have to be careful. You really can't name sources. You can't say where you got something from. What has to happen in terms of proof is you have to do a relative proof where you show, you, you provide enough obvious and in public information that you can demonstrate something, uh, uh, the general knowledge to be false. In other words, you have to be observant enough to mark and note events that occur within society, that are in the, within the public eye, that demonstrate that general knowledge is not absolutely correct. In other words, that there's a problem with the general knowledge or the way we think about things in general. This is what we're talking about. You use the term in general. It's because we're talking about a, a general, general thing. We're not going into the specifics of it. If you do go into the specifics, sometimes you find this really, you know, some, pro some problems with it. And this is, in many cases, uh, kind of what we see in society. And one of the things that we see in society, in terms of the rhetoric for girls, anyways, uh, is one of the rhetoric is that girls are smaller than boys. And again, these terms are in general, they're generalized terms. And if you look at the surface of this, you see that in general, if you look at the, gr the grades for girls on average, and the amount that girls read, you'll find that girls on average read more than boys do. Uh, when boys do read, it's not that, that boys don't read, when boys do read, they become geeks. They're considered to be geeks, they're considered to be nerds, and so on and so forth. Uh, but this is not the case with girls. It's, it, it's generally accepted for girls to be smart, to read, to do well in school, to have good grades. Where for boys, it's kind of, you got to be, uh, as your macho image, you need to be sports oriented. You need to be, uh, in many cases, a, a, Neanderthal, a Neanderthal knuckle dragger. Uh, in other words, the more ape-like you, ape you are as a guy, the better. In other words, if you're an animal or if you're... Your IQ is significantly, you know, down there, uh, and you know you're not into reading, you're not into tea, you're not into, you know, the what they call the upper level things in terms of, you know, intellectual stuff. Where now the term is girl stuff. Then, you're that's your standard guy. That's the standard view. The standard view of the guy. And if you're not that part of, then you're now classified as different. And different can be described in a variety of different ways including meaning to be gay. Uh, but this, again, these generalized terms are, are, are not, there are problems with them. Uh, and this is true, same thing with the, the generalized term that girls are more spiritual. And you see that in the guys' magazines that's all filled with hunting. It's all, it's all guys' stuff. It's uh, hunting, it's fishing, it's uh, cars, it's sports. And you will not find in a guy's magazine, as you will in girls' magazines, like a beauty magazine and so on and so forth, you will not find anything about uh, tarot cards, you will not find anything about fortunes, you will not find anything about scented candles or, or yoga mats or yoga in general. In other words, uh, the general guy-oriented things are not spiritual, but general girl-oriented general, general girl things are. And so you could simply say, but from the outset, you can observe that the uh, girls are, generally speaking, more spiritual than guys. And so this is the rhetoric here. This is we're start, start, starting to take a look at the rhetoric. Um, and this sort of comes into a, a whole thing on feminism. This sort of brings us all into feminism. And what we see and understand about feminism itself. And... Uh, what you'll find is that there's not necessarily a particular ideal of feminism, but there are multiple streams and ideals of feminism, just the way there are multiple ideals in, uh, in almost about anything. You know, someone talks about vegetarianism. Well, there's more than one type of vegetarian. If, if you even know if you know what a vegan is, you'll know that a vegan and a vegetarian are not the same thing. Even though they're supposed to be the same thing on the surface, well, aren't they all just vegetarians? Well, no. If you go look at the specifics of it, you look at what they each term, what they each believe, and and what they what, what they eat, what their diets are, you'll find that, uh, uh, you know, that there are, there are differences. And so this is kind of where we're, where we're going to go next in the next segment. We're going to start taking a look at some of the sort of reality of things in here. 
uh, and get into some of the more specifics. So, anyways, I'll be back in the next segment. Uh, uh, I'll be with you shortly, and we'll get further into the reality. We'll start looking into this a little bit more, and, uh, you know, we'll start picking this apart. Alrighty, I'll see you then. <laughs> Welcome back. Uh, we're beginning. We're going to begin the next segment of uh, the, the sort of the third segment of uh, the IMO vlog. We're talking about uh, tween and teen, teen girls, uh, and we talked about scented candles. We talk about uh, you know that girls are generally viewed as more spiritual. Girls are generally viewed as being smarter, and this all has to do with uh, the overall divide between guys and girls uh, guys are uh, are to be ape like to be animal like and girls are to be j just sort of generally uh, I would I would give the term Victorian a lot of the Victorian standard that you would find in novels like Pride and Prejudice and or uh, in uh, writ books by, written by authors like the women's Victorian authors like uh, Jane Austen, uh, Emily Bronte, the Bronte sisters. And if you sit down and read those books, you will find a lot of parallels between today's girls and the Victorian girls. There's a lot of the Victorian attitudes. Excuse me. A lot of the Victorian attitudes are still around today, particularly for girls. Uh, for guys, that's completely gone. Guys, the only time you will find a Victorian attitude for guys in terms of being uh, proper and upstanding is uh, gener generally classified as being gay. Although that's not necessarily the case, it's just simply that's where the general knowledge has classified things as today. You know, So if you're uh, uh, a, a sort of a Victorian gentleman, uh, all of a sudden now you're no longer a standard guy, but now you are uh, classified as being gay. And I said, this is not, this is a generalized stereotype that has become, uh, you know, general knowledge. It's, it's become accepted in society that this is the way things are. Although, this is, again, this is not necessarily the case. There are more specifics when you go into this, where it is not a necessity for someone who is, uh, for a guy who is of Victorian stature in their behavior to be a homosexual. It doesn't, that, that, that. One does not equate with the other simply because one is one thing does not necessarily mean that they are the other. So, again, excuse me, it's, I've got a bit of a, <laughs> a, 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 a a nasal passage issue, so um, and please excuse that. And as I said, we are real here. We're not uh, hiding anything. Nothing's going to be edited out. We're going to continue on as we... Uh, <laughs> <laughs> as we speak, and I think this is the kind of the way it is. As you start speaking, you know, things don't bother you when you're normally sitting around necessarily. But as soon as as soon as you start speaking, you have to be <laughs> uh, you have to be in a presentable form. All of a sudden, your eyes starts to itch, your ears starts to itch, your nose starts to itch. <laughs> these general things, uh, you know, they occur. <laughs> <laughs> and, you know, they, they have the hum, the human element has to be dealt with. Uh, uh, <laughs> well, let's go back to what we were talking about before. Um, and here's where where again where where a lot of rhetoric comes in and it doesn't necessarily necessarily meet the reality. It says, well, on average, girls do read more than boys. And all of a sudden, it changes. Though when you go into uh, to a into the geek realm, things start to change. And what you'll find that once you start moving into the geek realm, and most guys don't want to be geeks, and neither than most girls, uh, it's just generally accepted that a girl will do better on average than a guy. Will. Girls on average will have higher a higher uh, vocabulary, that, you know, uh, than a guy will. They'll have better social skills than a guy will. Um, this is all part of the uh, the standard view uh, 
of girls today. And this, in many cases, in terms of the posture, the poise, the the uh, the speech patterns, the um, the, the what's this, what poise is. Um, is all very Victorian. If you look at the movie Mean Girls, Mean Girls is exactly Victorian. It is very Victorian. Uh, you are mean to people as a mean girl, not with a smart, with not the way guys do. Guys will, will be openly aggressive, but the feminine view, the the Victorian view of a female on the attack, is she'll kill you with kindness. In other words is done with a smile, as if she's being polite about it. But behind there, the subtext of what's being stated is actually an insult. <laughs> the bizarre part is, is that, well, for English, this is really treacherous. Tre treacherous. But if you're Greek, this is not treacherous, this is standard. Is that Greeks, in many cases, will often phrase insults as compliments. And so, a Greek can often compliment you, you know, and but the, com the compliment is not necessarily an actual compliment. It is actually a insult. But it's phrased as a, and stated as a compliment. <laughs> and so, this is it. These things, in many cases, are cultural. They're not, they, 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 they do not pass uh, 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 cultural boundaries in, in certain aspects. But in certain aspects, they do. Uh, but as I say, go go into the uh, go into uh, the geek stage of things when guys are geeks and all of a sudden the rhetoric of gr girls are smarter than boys starts to start to start to disappear and it particularly starts to disappear when you're talking about girls going into engineering into the uh, heavily mathematical science the mathematical sciences and girls are, it, it, up until basically grade ten girls are superior even in the maths. And sciences, they're superior. It's around the grade 10 mark that things begin to shift. And as girls begin to decline, guys start to grow, you know, to, to uh, and not necessarily evolve, but they bloom or, or, or grow into the sciences, they grow into the mathematics, and they succeed where girls tend to fail. And a lot of times the failure of girls is not necessarily that they're bad at the subject. It's the psychology that occurs. It's the, it's the psychology of the environment that really uh, seems to knock a girl out. And, and I've, known, I've, known, I've known of several, several girls who've tried to come into the higher levels of research and science like that. And, you know, you're, you're encouraging them along. They're doing very well in grade Grade seven, grade eight, grade nine, they do very well. Grade ten, they start to get shaky. Their confidence starts to get shaken. Because all of a sudden the topics seem to be a little bit beyond them. And when something is beyond them and they're not getting the marks that they think they should be getting, in other words, they're not meeting to the getting the they're not uh, meeting the standard that they assume that they should be having, they start having problems, start obsessing about it. And this obsession causes a lot of uh, stress. And as the stress wears them down, at some point in time, they begin to start dropping out of the sciences and the, ma and the mathematics. So that what you have, by the time you have in grade 12 and you're going into your first year of university uh, for the engineering and the sciences, like the, the, the mathematically based sciences, this includes physics and, you know, stuff like that, uh, the ratio of guys to girls is that the girls are significantly less than the guys. In other words, you are now looking at a, at a uh, male-dominated environment. And many girls have a problem with male-dominated envi um, dominated environments. Uh, dominated environments. And this includes, this can be actually seen if you go into an anime environment, which is predominantly uh, uh, aimed at guys, it is a male-dominated environment. It is, in many girls' terms, misogynistic. It is very much aimed at what girls would view as degrading to for towards females. 
And they don't realize that this is the standard guy view, that this is the way guys standardly think, even smarter, intelligent guys, when they, they still have their general base guy feelings in terms of how they relate to women. And their, their if you will, respect of women is very little. Their views of women uh, and the relationship is more one of mechanics and immediate physical physical satisfaction than it is about the emotion or the um, uh, the uh, uh, the overall environment of the relationship. Matter of fact, for the guy, there is no real consideration of the relationship other than the immediate need, uh, and that's in many cases the way guys view things. This is the way they uh, write for anime. This is the way they draw for anime. Uh, and you can see this, you go onto any guy's site that does anime, any any guy anime artist, and you will find a lot of um, female objectivity. In other words, things are very physical. You go to a female artist who does a lot of anime work. You'll find there are female artists who do anime work. And you'll find a lot of beautiful gowns, you'll find a lot of beautiful dresses in the... Uh, in you will not find the physical images, you know, the physical representation of anime figures that you will find with guys. And this, in many cases, uh, sort of uh, gives you an understanding of the difference between the thought patterns and the behavior patterns between guys and girls, and that girls will often have a very difficult time because of this entering into a male-dominated environment because they will be very intimidated because guys are very competitive. They do intend to be t intimidating, even on the geek level. They're very competitive still. Uh, and their goal is to intimidate. It's not that they're intimidating a girl. This is the whole, the whole thing is not that this is the, they're just some aiming this at the girl. The general environment is intimidation. Guys typically compete. They're very competitive and they're very aggressive with their, with their competition, whether it's sports or even intellectual pursuits. Or even, even games, they're very competitive at games, you know, whether it's, you know, football, Trivial Pursuit, or, or let's say Dungeons and Dragons. There is a, a sense of competition amongst guys that simply doesn't, an aggression, that simply doesn't exist with girls. And so a girl, in order to be in a male-dominated environment, will have to accept that this is the way the guys are. But more often than not, they can't do that. They, 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 the environment is simply isn't for them. And so they back off the environment. They don't look for an alternative and say, well, how can I exist as a physicist, as an engineer, in an environment that's like this? That, that is, you know, contrary to what I think and feel. And this pushes a lot of the girls out of the, what they call, the guy geek dome. There's a, the divide in the, in the, in the nerd and geek, in the nerd and geek dome. There is a divide between male and female. There's something that the, there are areas that are acceptable for females, and there are areas that are acceptable for males. And your lower, uh, your your sort of female-dominated areas are more the arts, your psychology, your medicine, uh, things where uh, personal attachment, personal involvement can be given. In other words, there's a relationship with the patient. There's a relationship with the novel. There's a relationship with the writing. There's a relationship there there's that, that the girl can put their relationship into. The fields that are less personal, that are, they're more uh, mechanical and physical, like engineering, are more where the guys are, they're, where there is no emotion. There's no, I mean, if you look at most engineering terms, you look at uh, the, the acronyms that engineers produce. One of the things that I found that, uh, you know, watching girls trying to get into computer science, one of the problems that girls have with computer science is that they don't understand guy terminology, particularly the geek terminology, the uh, acronyms. And they try to, try to figure out, well, what's behind this? What's the subtext to this particular name? Or what they, why they're calling what they're calling it? And the fact is, there is none. Guys don't have that. It's simply, it is what it is, and that's it. There's no complexity behind it. But if you assume there's a complexity behind it, you're going to get trapped. And anyways, we're going to continue back with our next segment, our uh, third and final segment 
Uh, we're we're going to continue on with this. We're going to continue on with our discussion. We'll get into a, a little bit more of this and uh, <laughs> see where things go. <laughs> All righty. See you in the next segment. <laughs> Alrighty, welcome back to the next, to the, I think the third and last segment here. Uh, I've kind of lost track. <laughs> lost track of where we are. Uh, I was talking about the way uh, guys and girls view things, the way uh, there are there is a significant difference between the way guys and girls think, the difference in the divide in the environments that they exist in. And a lot of times when girls go and try to go into a guy's environment, they try to break the sort of they call it breaking the glass ceiling. Is it not that there's no real, there's actually a glass ceiling there? It's just this is just the, generally what the guy environment is, and they're not going to change. And unless a girl accepts this and understands that guys will not change, that they will generally behave the way they are, even if they're forced to on the surface and in public say, oh, yes, everything is equal. The competitive environment is such that they will compete as hard against the, uh, as hard as against the women as they will the guy. But the girls uh, and women in the, in the environment, in the competitive environment, will take this person and say, well, this person is out to get me. Well, yeah, they are to get you. But those, the women will say, well, they're out to get me because I'm a, wo I'm a woman. No. They're not out to get you because you're a woman. They're out to get you. Period. <laughs> that, that, that's it. Is it that... The competitive environment, the competitive male environment is is one that's pretty, you know, I would use the term narcissistic. Uh, is about the self. It's about your own uh, uh, prowess. It's about your own uh, dominance of the environment. Guys are out to dominate the environment. And, and from their perspective, they're out to dominate their environment. It, it, it's a matter of possession. And everything that's within their environment is their possession. And it's not an issue of male and female. It's an issue of dominance. And, then, and what happens is it, it's not something that's personal for them. This is the way they are. This is the way a lot of guys think. This is the way they're trained to be. Look at all the sports. The sports attitude whether it's in a guy who is in sports or in an intellectual field or in the office or whatever, that overall sports aggression, the competitiveness, and this is why women really can't do as well in guys' male sports as males can, is that the level of aggression needed for a woman uh, to compete against male aggression simply isn't there. And this actually can be seen in larger society. If you look at, uh, and I've done this for, for robotics, uh, um, and this is where a large chunk of this is being done. Is I come from psycho I come into psychology not from a psychology point of standpoint, but from an, uh, a quantum physics standpoint. Uh, looking into uh, robotics, looking into artificial intelligence, looking to build cyborgs and androids. You have to come up with a model of a human being and understand how human beings behave in order to create an artificial intelligence. Model. If you want a robot that doesn't attack you, this is the goal you have, robots that, that, you know, that don't get up there and attack you, you have to find and see, okay, well, in society, is there a difference between males and females in terms of the level of violence? And all you have to do is go into the criminal environment, go into the uh, uh, conviction rates. Okay, well, who's in prison, who, for, particularly for violent crimes? And if you look at to see is, okay, is there a divide between males and females and you will find that that typically uh, there are significantly more males in for violent crimes than are for fe than are females so you can come to the observation you can come to the conclusion through observation that guys are generally more violent and more aggressive than females are this is simply a general pattern here that does not necessarily mean that there are exceptions to the rule or that there are cases where uh, that me females can be violent, or, or sure, can be violent because they can be. Uh, it's just simply that the general rule is that the, that women are not as violent as men are. Uh, 
And so if you want to create a robot that says, well, if you want to create a robot that does not attack you, does not, that does not, does not have a tendency towards violence, then you need to create a female robot. And it also starts to reason that says, that, well, if this is a self-learning robot, if this android or cyborg, this cybernetic entity, is going to be self-learning, and in some cases, in some aspect, self-aware, you also know that anything, anything that is self-aware, that's self-learning, that is, that is in an environment that is abusive and violent, will become abusive and violent. This is known for kids. You put a, put a kid inside an adult prison, that kid will not grow up to be corrected and then be a nice adult. The, that kid will be in, become a violent criminal. And this is what we've seen again and again. That kids do not do well in, in, in a criminal environment. You put the kid in a criminal environment because they, you want to punish them as an adult. You want to teach them a lesson. Well, you've basically destroyed that kid because that kid will never be the same again. That kid will become violent. They will, he will learn from the environment that he has been placed in. And he will become the environment he is placed in. So this tells you that, you, you know, well, one, yes, the robots will have to be female. And two, that you cannot use a robot that is self-aware and self-thinking, uh, self-learning. You, you cannot put them in an environment that is violent and abusive. And the thing is that most women do tend to, tend, do tend to shy away from this particular uh, uh, abusive environment. And if that environment, you know, and that means in many cases if a, if a male environment is like that, and it's engineering or anime or whatever, uh, if that's a typical environment, then women will tend to shy away from it because it's simply not within their person. It's not within their their personal characteristics. It's not within their within their character. And again, it's not as I said. It's not necessarily a bad thing. This isn't isn't necessarily a bad thing. I mean, the feminist views it as a bad thing. The feminists view that you know, in order from a female to be exactly equal to a female, it's equal to a male that. Feminism, uh, the female has become more masculine. And in many cases, you'll see this a lot with feminists. Uh, they'll become, or, or attempt to become, and then they'll, and the, the attempt to become more masculine is actually very stereotypical. And this is sort of what, uh, what, what, what uh, gay males do. Gay males will take the, the stereotypical view of females and, and emulate that. The stereotypical gay man emulates and behaves like a stereotypical female. They do not behave like a female. If you know, if you sit down and you talk to a real female and you talk to someone who's gay, you'll find that there are stark differences. What you will find is you will find that the gay male is behaving in a stereotypical manner. They're, they're, they're behaving as a stereotypical woman. They're not behaving as a natural woman or a natural female. They're behaving as a stereotypical one. In other words, they are behaving according to their perception of what a woman is or what a female is. They aren't really that. And this same thing goes for feminists who try to adopt a masculine view. And you'll see this. You'll see that, that the, mas the, the masculine view of feminism is not necessarily there in terms of where it is for males, in terms of actual male behavior. And in many cases, feminism, this is where feminism fails because they attempt to be masculine, but because it's simply not within them in many cases. Again, we're talking generally. There are cases where this does go forward. Uh, you will find that what you get in terms of a feminist, feminist is you will have a, in many ways, an effeminate, uh, an, an effeminate male. You won't get a masculine male, but you'll get an effeminate male. That's as far as feminists can actually go, in most cases. And that's it. This is the standard view. This is the standard things that's presented in the textbook. That girls need to be, in order to be just like the men, they need to pump up their what they call self-esteem. But if you look at self-esteem, you look at the definition of self-esteem, you have to, and you realize that there are two different words. Self is means yourself, things that you do yourself. And esteem means you look at the esteem. Esteem is a is a term of honor. It is something that is given to you. Like 
you cannot give yourself respect. In other words, respect is something that's given to you uh, by others. Esteem is something given to you by others. If you give yourself respect and give yourself esteem, and esteem is actually a higher accolade, it's a, it's a higher honor than simply, oh, I'm a nice guy uh, or a nice person. You realize that self-esteem actually matches the term uh, narcissism. In other words, uh, self-esteem and narcissism are uh, are synonymous. I almost forgot the word there. <laughs> uh, so what happens, is what they're basically teaching uh, girls in school today is they're teaching them to be narcissists. That you need to believe in yourself, you need to be uh, uh, walk tall, walk proud, you know, don't let anyone tell you what th you can't do something, uh, take what you want, and so on and so forth. Uh, what they don't do in many cases, they don't, uh, they don't really talk about the real challenges of dealing with things in the world, in your environment, that conflict with your behavioral makeup. So in other, in other words, females have one particular, particular uh, behavioral makeup, and they often have to encounter a male-dominated environment in which the male characteristic dominates. Well, how does a female who is, in many cases, very different from the male, from, from the male cope with and deal with what the male environment is, is, pre is presenting? And this is completely missed out when you're talking about feminism. Feminism does not deal with the, the fund fundamental, the underlying behavior and the challenges to the behavior that cause the conflict between males and females. And the thing is, one aspect of it again, comes from, from the, what we call textbook psychology. And we are going to have to go into textbook psychology in the next segment. We are going to be looking, in the next episode, we're going to be talking about textbook psychology because we're going to branch further into this. We're going to look at some of the terminology and how some of the terminology really and in, in, in the views uh, come into and really uh, sort of create the divide between the reality of what a girl is and the rhetoric of what a girl is. In other words, yes, girls are generally smarter. Yes, girls on, on, on average are more spiritual. But how deep, what is the reality there? What's actually going on? And you'll find that the reality is significantly different from the rhetoric. And it's, it's in many cases, it has to do in many cases with the, the psychology of the environment, as I stated. And the psychology environment, if you're looking at the general environment, is done by textbook psychology. If you're in a textbook environment, you're going to have textbook psychology. And these are things like uh, pop psychology. This is Dr. Phil. This is Oprah. This is uh, Jerry Springer. All these things wrapped together become... Uh, pop psychology, textbook psychology, that becomes the underlying behaviors, and this, is, this includes feminism, that becomes the underlying behaviors that sort of drive and generate what society is. And the thing is, we have an option here. And this is for everybody here. This is, again, I'm an individual. I'm an in, actually not a socialist. I'm an individualist. And I believe in individual choices. So it doesn't matter whether you're me, me, male or female. You can make whatever choices you want to make. And you don't, And I don't believe that she should be forced into being one group or the other. It's whatever you choose. But the thing is, you have to understand what your options are and what are the consequences of making certain choices are. And you also have to understand that there are consequences. Let's say you choose not to do something. Even choosing not to do something will have a consequence to it. And the question is, are the consequences acceptable or not acceptable to you? And this is where we talk about morality, we talk about the results of morality, we talk about the consequences of morality or our lack of morality. Uh, in other words, we're getting into a lot of base understanding of how society is, how society works. And this is where we're going to go in the next episode. You'll see how that in-depth is not five minutes, that this is going beyond the textbook, is peeling back the layers and giving you an overall view that you don't get anywhere else. Anyways, I hope you stay tuned. If you have questions, leave them down below. And I will answer any questions you have or comments in the video. 
Yeah. I'm going to talk about what you say in the comments down below on the air in the video. All right. I'm Dr. Danny Karras. This is uh, IMO Vlogs. I will see you in next week's episode. All right. Take it easy. Bye-bye. Democratic Earth. Earth.